Friends, our topic today is going to be on religion as the cause of war, hatred, and division. We want to explore this topic and first begin with empathizing with this concern, and then to move on to examine the logic that underlies it and actually how we can solve the problem of the alienation and division that often happens upon the borderlines between different religions and religions and the non-religious. Uh, please remember that this is just a personal opinion coming from myself. Uh, for official Baha'i perspectives and actual official Baha'i scriptures, please go to Baha'i.org. And also remember that underneath this video is actually an audio recording of this talk and all of the references used there. Thank you very much. I also want to make very clear what this topic is. This is not itself a study of, for example, Jihad. This is not uh, the concept of holy war in Islam. This is not a study of uh, the use of military force within the Old Testament. Or, for example, the issue surrounding war that is played out within the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu texts. This is particularly a question about the very nature of being religious and actually how it relates to alienating people, dividing them, and causing warfare. When I consider this topic, as with the topics that we consider throughout this channel on Bridging Beliefs. I put it in the context of an invitation to a friend to join within the core activities, the ways that Baha'is are reaching out to their neighbors and friends and trying to actually build society. So if I'm actually approaching somebody and I ask them to join me in a devotional, or join me in actually helping do children's classes, or junior youth groups, or joining a study circle, that individual turns to me and expresses this apprehension, this concern, which is that, well, you know, I, I really like the Baha'is, you, you seem like really wonderful people. At the same time, religion has been the cause of so much war and division and hatred. What do we say to these individuals? I think one of the first and foremost things we need to actually do is to empathize. It is important to really, really emotionally understand this issue. There have been wars throughout human history and if you will, persecutions of people throughout human history along religious lines. The most common ones that arise in people's minds are things like the Inquisition or the Crusades. But these go all the way to the battles between the Sunni and the Shia uh, sects of Islam, between Protestants and Catholics, between different Protestant groups, between Catholics and the Greek Orthodox. We see these things happening between Confucians and Buddhists and Buddhists and Confucians, from Shintoists to Muslims and Hindus and Hindus and Buddhists. Um, so if we really, really try our best to actually look at some of the history of these things, and we see in front of ourselves somebody who is really, if you will, feeling an aversion to the topic because of the amount of suffering that has been caused, I think it's important that we don't have a knee-jerk reaction ourselves and actually really pause and genuinely think about this. There is a beautiful principle actually being expressed here, and that principle is, I dislike division, hatred, and disunity within the human family, and I see this here as being the cause of these self-evidently dark things, disunity, hatred, and division. And I think when I think, when I think of this, I, my mind immediately jumps to a series of quotes. The first is from Shoghi Effendi. True, the minds of many are turned away from all that sounds religious. But it is only because they are ill-advised as to the meaning of true religion. And it is just that mission that devolves upon us to give a new viewpoint, to revive fresh hopes, and to guide by the sacred utterances the thoughts and actions of mankind. In this passage from Shoghi Effendi, one of the first things that stands out to me is actually the responsibility for educating humankind on the very nature of religion is placed upon the believer. And there's many texts within the Baha'i writings that I, in my experience, that actually really push this way. They're saying, yes, there is a misunderstanding about religion. There is a misunderstanding about history. And it's up to the Baha'is to actually offer a new insight, to revive hopes that people once had in these institutions, by trying our best to give them a new perspective on religion itself. So the responsibility falls to the believer. 
the other thing here is that in order to do so, we have to empathize and understand. The minds of many are turned away, but it's because they are ill-advised. And it's just that mission that devolves upon us. So we actually have to think how they see this, and then do our best to actually offer fresh insight. The greatest cause of human alienation has been religion, because each party has considered the belief of the other as an asima and deprived of the mercy of God. So what has been the greatest cause of human alienation? According to this passage, it has been religion. Why? Because they have believed that the other party has been deprived of the grace of God. Now listen to this next passage from Abdu'l-Bahá. It is evident that prejudices arising from adherence to religious forms and imitation of ancestral beliefs have hindered the progress of humanity thousands of years. How many wars and battles have been fought? How much division, discord, and hatred have been caused by this form of prejudice? Here in this talk um, by Abdu'l-Bahá in the Promulgation of Universal Peace, he is stating that it is evident that adherence to religious forms and imitation of ancestral beliefs have hindered the progress of humanity for thousands of years. So there is a certain way of treating religion, a certain way of actually relating to religious truth claims, that actually really, really just automatically begins to produce this division. And it's this we have to understand more deeply. If religion proves to be the source of hatred, enmity, and contention, if it becomes the cause of warfare and strife, and influences men to kill each other, its absence is preferable, for that which is productive of hatred amongst the people is rejected by God. It is evident, therefore, that the divine teachings are intended to create a bond of unity in the human world, and establish the foundations of love and fellowship among mankind. Divine religion is not a cause for discord and disagreement. If religion becomes a source of antagonism and strife, the absence of religion is to be preferred. Religion is meant to be the quickening life of the body politic. If it be the cause of death to humanity, its non-existence would be a blessing and benefit to man. Therefore, in this day the divine teachings must be sought for they are the remedies for the present conditions of the world of humanity." It is amazing how many times this is stated within the Baha'i Writings. I actually had to go through a very large compilation I have in order to select a few just to express this point. The point being that if religion, which is meant to actually create peace and unity and bonds of love, begins to cause hatred and division, its absence is preferable. It's meant to be a quickening spirit, Abdu'l-Bahá says. And I think what's really important here is to put this in a certain other context so we can see this. And it's that of science. The virtues of humanity are many, but science is the most noble of them all. It is shocking, once again, how highly the use of the intellect and science is extolled within the Baha'i Writings. And yet, I would suggest taking these quotes that we've been looking at and putting instead of religion, we actually put the word science therein. If science itself, which is meant to actually raise up humankind, is meant to actually heal the body politic, is meant to quicken the minds of humankind, was itself only productive of engines of war and strife and division and hatred, the absence of that science would be preferable. We actually have a duty to root out the fundamental cause of that division, alienation, absence, and hatred. Just as we would within the scientific institutions, if they themselves are productive only of devastation and suffering. In examining this entire topic, we actually have to keep in mind that the Baha'i Faith itself rejects blind faith and adherence to ancestral imitations or dogmas. He has endowed him with mind, or the faculty of reasoning, by the exercise of which he is to investigate and discover the truth. And that which he finds real and true, he must accept. He must not be an imitator or blind follower of any soul. He must not rely implicitly upon the opinion of any man without investigation. Nay, 
Each soul must seek intelligently and independently, arriving at a real conclusion and bound only by that reality. The greatest cause of bereavement and disheartening in the world of humanity is ignorance based upon blind imitation. Humanity has been given the faculty of reasoning. We have an obligation to use it. We cannot actually just take what someone else has told us and assume that is our belief system, when it is something of great import and value. I will say quickly that this actually relates to this topic, because I find very often that beliefs surrounding religion and its role in society are things that people just pass on, that they themselves are not often genuinely investigated and genuinely explored. They are just conventional wisdom about religion. And to the Baha'is, we have to remember this is exactly what Shoghi Effendi has just said, that the perspective that people have has been passed along, and it is ill-advised, and the duty devolves upon us to show a better perspective. In the context of faith, let us look at actually a definition of faith by Abdu'l Baha. Baha'u'llah has declared that religion must be in accord with science and reason. If it does not correspond with scientific principles and the processes of reason, it is superstition. For God has endowed us with faculties by which we may comprehend the realities of things, contemplate reality itself. If religion is opposed to reason and science, faith is impossible. And when faith and confidence in the divine religion are not manifest in the heart, there can be no spiritual attainment. A religion is opposed to reason, if it is opposed to science. Here it actually says faith is impossible. Why? Because you cannot actually, the heart cannot accept what the mind cannot understand. There can be no spiritual attainment, is what is actually said. Let us look at another quote quickly. If religious belief and doctrine is at variance with reason, it proceeds from the limited mind of man and not from God. Therefore, it is unworthy of belief and not deserving of attention. The heart finds no rest in it, and real faith is impossible. How can man believe that which he knows to be opposed to reason? Is this possible? Can the heart accept that which reason denies? So if it is at variance with reason, it is not worthy of attention. And the faith can actually not actually be established within the human heart if it is something that is completely irrational. Imitation destroys the foundation of religion, extinguishes the spirituality of the human world, transforms heavenly illumination into darkness, and deprives man of the knowledge of God. It is the cause of the victory of materialism and infidelity over religion. It is a denial of divinity and the law of revelation. It refuses prophethood and rejects the kingdom of God. When materialists subject limit imitations to the intellectual analysis of reason, they find them to be mere superstitions. Therefore, they deny religion. Once again, this is actually such a pregnant quote. There are so many things within this quote that would deserve a really long discussion. In short, however, what are we being told? That imitation, the refusal to use one's own intellect in the investigation of truth, and the acceptance of belief systems that have been given to you without critical thought, does what? It extinguishes spirituality from the human world. It actually eradicates the very thing that religion actually was meant to bring. It is a remedy, and this is actually the sickness itself, this imitation and blind adherence to dogma. And then it says that it is the cause of victory over materialism and infidelity, the breaking of a covenant. Why? Here, it says, when materialists subject imitations to the intellectual analysis of reason and find them to be mere superstitions, therefore they deny religion. Once again, this brings us back to the, the responsibility devolving upon the believer. If we are presenting concepts that we think are religious to a human mind who is actually seeking to be critical and honest and intellectual and investigative, they to then turn this and see this as ridiculous and they deny it, that is actually our fault. 
It is our duty to do the best we can, to understand issues as best we can, and present them in the most rational light we possibly can. When it comes to this question of religion causing war, it is vital that we actually are willing to investigate it. And when I say we, I mean whether a person is a Baha'i, a Muslim, a Christian, an atheist, an agnostic, a secularist, it doesn't matter. We actually have to be willing to use the best fruits of human knowledge to investigate it. This concept of the absence of religion being preferable, if in fact religion is only productive of hatred and division, really, really comes to a culmination or, or a crescendo in this quote from Abdu'l-Baha. The third teaching of Baha'u'llah is that religion must be the source of fellowship, the cause of unity, and the nearness of God to man. If it rouses hatred and strife, it is evident that absence of religion is preferable, and an irreligious man better than one who professes it. According to the divine will and intention, religion should be the cause of love and agreement, a bond to unify all mankind, for it is a message of peace and goodwill to man from God. In this quote, and it's very clear, Abdu'l-Baha states that an irreligious person is better than a religious one if the outcome of that person's religion is hatred and division amongst other people because of that belief. So if I actually take on the faith of Islam, and I actually then have that faith cause me to hate and vilify other individuals, it would be better if I was irreligious. If I myself take on the mantle of Buddhism, and all that comes out of that in the end is actually anger and division towards my Hindu brother or my Christian brother, then it would be better if I had not accepted the Buddha and the Dharma. The question that arises here then, given religion has been the cause of so much war, hatred, and division, how can we be religious? I call this section the Six O'Clock News and the Many Masks of Madness. As it pertains to the Six O'Clock News, the point is simply this. When we watch the news, we get a very skewed perspective of what's going on in our society. I think everyone generally knows this. Why? Because news agencies are, for the most part, or sorry, exclusively almost, businesses. They actually have their business based upon how many people are watching. When you put on something very shocking, bring something very startling, something even tragic and graphic, people watch. This is like when you're driving down the road and there's a car crash on the side of the road and everybody's slowing down to take a look. But they may not slow down to take a look at a father holding the hand of his daughter walking down having a loving conversation. It's not graphic. It's not in your face enough. History is much like this. We do have disciplines like social history where we're trying to look at the way the average person lived, the way the average person loved, the arts they played, the, 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 the sentiments they expressed, the jokes they told, the things they loved. But for the most part, what do we find when we actually look at history? We see kings, queens, princes, princesses, great wars, great empires, great rises, and great falls. And I think this really does skew the actual reality of what the average person did, thought, felt, how they actually carried forward an ever-advancing civilization. And oftentimes, because history as itself is punctuated by these things, we get a sense that that is the majority of history. The battles, the persecutions, when in actual fact, for most of the stretches of time, the average person is just loving their neighbor and trying to get by and doing the best they can to live out the faith that they actually believe. This is not to actually diminish the severity of some of the things that have happened, but it's to trying to really take a look at actually how we view history and see that often we're watching the six o'clock news. The second, which is the masks of madness, is that very often warfare is actually conducted on its surface for certain ideological reasons, when that is not actually what's going on. Where you actually have the proclaimed reason to be this crusade, or this campaign, when in actual fact, the, the underlying reason itself, what is behind the masks of madness, is actually economic. 
or racial or ideological in a different domain. That very often we actually have to really look at the history of conflicts and warfare to get a better picture of what's going on. Once again, we have to use critical analysis to our best understand. There are expressions of religion causing war that within this six o'clock news issue and the issue of the massive madness are patently absurd. People, I've heard this myself, will say things like, you know, every, every war in history has been caused by religion. And this really is silly. Because if you go in, and I suggest people do it, go and look at the Encyclopedia of War and actually run through the wars themselves, and you will find the vast majority of them are not religious. Nevertheless, on the empathy side, some have been, and they have been brutal. This next section is, I think, honestly, one of the more important issues. When facing the question of religion and the issue of war and division. I call this false neutrality with a quote, but I'm out of the frying pan. And there's an idiom that some may not know, which is uh, out of the frying pan and into the fire. When you think you've actually got out of the hottest place, but in actual fact what has happened is you've fallen far deeper. And I think this is a really important issue. First, to begin. At times the aversion to religion because of the war and hatred and division is really a genuine, genuine, heartfelt response to suffering. There is a virtuous intention here. And the desire to avoid religious discussions or to avoid religious affiliation is driven by this love of humankind. And it's important to always keep that in mind. At the same time, I would suggest you're actually stepping out of the frying pan and into the fire. Why? Because when an individual actually states that they are, say, for example, an atheist, and therefore not religious, they are still defining themselves in opposition to a Buddhist or to a Hindu. When a person actually states that they are secularist, you know, I'm not religious myself, which I wasn't for a large portion of my life, I am not somehow getting out of the battle or out of the fray. Why? Because my belief systems still have direct bearing upon the belief systems of others. My social concerns are right at that moment actually having a bearing upon the kinds of conversations and affiliations one can have. And they invariably bear upon issues of political interactions. If I myself am not religious, I do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If I did believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, I would be a Christian. If I am not religious, I am not a Muslim. I therefore do not believe that the Prophet Muhammad was a messenger from God. I do not believe that the Quran is the express word of God. If I did, I would be a Muslim. This goes for Buddhism. If I actually believe that the Buddha is the Awakened One, the Tathagata, who is himself an expression of the Dharma, I would be a Buddhist. But if I myself am not religious, I am actually on the opposite side of the fence of that individual who does believe that the Buddha is an expression of the Dharma, who does actually believe that the Prophet Muhammad is a prophet from God revealing the Word of God, or that Jesus Christ was the Logos, the Word of God made flesh. What, and this is fine, this is a perfectly acceptable position, but it does not remove me from a division based upon a difference of opinion and belief. No, it's just another case of a difference of opinion or a difference of belief. Oftentimes I've heard people say, well, I, I believe that they believe that. Which actually really doesn't mean anything. Of course you believe that they believe that. They just said <laughs> that they are Christian or Buddhist or Muslim. It does not remove the opposition, and I don't mean opposition in a negative sense, I just mean there are opposing views, for example, on the station of the New Testament, or the station of the person of Moses, or the station of the Buddha. We do not suddenly get out of, if you will, a contest of worldviews by saying we disagree with a whole bunch of worldviews. We might, however, simply be stating that we do not wish to have this kind of discussion. But I would suggest this as well actually 
condemns us to boiling division and antagonism. Because I think as a humankind, we actually have to hash these things out. We actually have to have these discussions. We actually have to make these discussions more loving and cordial, as opposed to simply avoiding the issues themselves. The point here is very simple. Staying outside of religion is not staying out of the contest of claims and truths, unless you simply mean that you're just refusing to actually discuss it. And what's interesting, why I said out of the frying pan into the fire, is because, and this is my own, obviously my perspective on, in my own study of comparative religion, but if I am a Christian, I at least believe that two very large communities actually have a part of the truth. One being the Jewish people, and actually the Christian fold. If I'm a Muslim, I can actually include the Christian, the Jewish, and the Islamic fold. Uh, even I would suggest, if you actually study the Pali Canon, the original scriptures of Buddhism, and you see therein reflected a vast, vast array of Hindu beliefs, you as a Buddhist can actually look in Hinduism and see therein a reflection of the Dharma. And you can say they have a piece of the truth. That they are actually somehow trying to seek to attain nirvana, maybe not doing it in its fullest expression. I myself as a Baha'i can actually look at a Jewish individual, a Christian, a Muslim, a Buddhist, and a Hindu, and actually say, actually they really do genuinely have honest revelations from God. There is beauty and profundity and wonder here. That's why I am still a student of the Bhagavad Gita of Hinduism, or the Upanishads, or the Quran, or the New Testament, or the Old Testament. I can actually say this. When I was a secularist, I was very, very honest about this. I can't say any of that. Actually, any of these individuals is following a belief system that is genuinely false. Why? Because it's predicated on the belief that this individual, be the Buddha, or the Prophet Muhammad, or Jesus Christ, or Moses, is a interlocutor, a mouthpiece for divine realms, an expression of transcendent spiritual truth. And I didn't believe that, so I would simply say, no, I actually, I, I believe you to be wrong. That is okay, we can still be friends, and we can still get along, and have wonderful, rich discussions. But you are wrong. Hence, prior to being a Baha'i, I actually disagreed with more people than I currently do on much more fundamental and far-reaching issues. Out of the frying pan, into the fire. So this fundamental point is what? That actually avoiding the topic of religion, or avoiding labeling, as often is said, oneself as religious, does not actually stop the division. The camps are still there, the, perspective, the, opposite, the opposing perspectives are still there. What we have to do best, if we are to remain in different groups and different belief systems, is to be able to lovingly disagree and have open discourse. And this is the Baha'i perspective. And if someone still in this point actually states, but I actually do believe that what they believe is true, I would still press the issue and I would say, so you do believe that the Prophet Muhammad is the Prophet of God, that there is no God but God, and that the Prophet Muhammad is the Prophet of God. And if they say yes, in essence they've said the Shahada, the Declaration of Faith, and are now a Muslim. But then I would ask, are you yourself someone who believes that the Buddha is an expression of the Dharma in this world, and that his teachings are there for the enlightening of all humankind, and are the only road to Nirvana? If that individual says yes, I would say, well, then you are a Buddhist, actually. And you should be open and honest about being a Buddhist. If, however, the individual says, well, I don't actually believe that the Prophet Muhammad was a prophet of God, then I would say, that's right. Then you yourself are not a Muslim, and you think what Muslims believe is wrong. And that's okay. If you don't believe the Quran is the word of God, then you're not a Muslim and you actually do not agree with all Muslims, and that is okay. It's perfectly fine to disagree with each other and be honest about it, so then we can actually have discussions. But to pretend that we don't disagree itself is merely dishonest and leaves it, if you will, simmering in the background. We now come to the problem of there being no options. What I mean by this is when we are really honestly attentive to history, 
an honest and genuinely attentive to the motives of individuals and states, cultures, and societies, we find that secularism and atheism itself, stepping wholly outside of theism entirely, or stepping wholly outside the religious, does not offer us any refuge from this problem. I want to start this section with a quote from Shoghi Effendi, and it's significantly long. But I would like us to actually hear the guardian of the Baha'i Faith expressing some of the historical issues that actually relate to this question in particular. The avowed purpose and the action of the responsible heads of the Union of Soviet Social Republics who, within their recognized and legitimate rights, have emphatically proclaimed and vigorously pursued their policy of uncompromising opposition to all forms of organized religious propaganda, have by their very nature created for those whose primary obligation is to labor unremittingly for the spread of the Baha'i faith, a state of affairs that is highly unfortunate and perplexing. Lately, however, due to circumstances wholly beyond their control and without being in the least implicated in political or subversive activity, our Baha'i brethren in those provinces have had to endure the rigid application of the principles already enunciated by the state authorities and universally enforced with regard to all other religious communities under their sway. Faithful to their policy of expropriating in the interests of the state all edifices and monuments of a religious character, they have a few months ago approached the Baha'i representatives in Turkestan and after protracted negotiations with them, decided to claim and enforce their right of ownership and control of that most cherished and universally prized Baha'i possession, the Mashriq al-Azkar of Ishkabad. The insistent and repeated representations made by the Baha'is, dutifully submitted and stressed by their local and national representatives, and duly reinforced by the action of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Persia, Emphasizing the international character and spiritual significance of the edifice and its close material as well as spiritual connection with the diverse Baha'i communities throughout the East and West have alas proved of no avail. The beloved temple which has been seized and expropriated and for three months closed under the seal of the municipal authorities was reopened and meetings were allowed to be conducted within its walls, only after the acceptance and signature by the Baha'i Spiritual Assembly of Ishkabad of an elaborate contract drawn by the Soviet authorities and recognizing the right of undisputed ownership by the state of the Mashriq al-Azkar and its dependencies. According to this contract, the temple is rented by the state for a period of five years to the local Baha'i community of that town. And in it are stipulated a number of obligations, financial and otherwise, expressly providing for fines and penalties in the event of the evasion or infringement of its provisions. To these measures, which the state, in the free exercise of its legitimate rights, has chosen to enforce, and with which the Baha'is, as befits their position as loyal and law-abiding citizens, have complied. Others have followed through, which, though of a different character, are nonetheless grievously affected, affecting our beloved cause. In Baku, the seat of the Soviet Republic of Caucasus, as well as in Ganji and the other neighboring towns, state orders, orally and in writing, have been officially communicated to the Baha'i assemblies and individual believers, suspending all meetings, commemoration gatherings, and festivals, suppressing the committees of all Baha'i local and national spiritual assemblies, prohibiting the raising of funds and the transmission of financial contributions to any center within or without Soviet jurisdiction, requiring the right of full and frequent inspection of the deliberations, decisions, plans, and actions of the Baha'i Assemblies, dissolving young men's clubs and children's organizations, imposing a strict censorship on all correspondence 
to and from Baha'i Assemblies, directing a minute investigation of Assemblies' papers and documents, suspending all Baha'i periodicals, bulletins, and magazines, and requiring the deportation of leading personalities in the cause, whether as public teachers and speakers or officers of Baha'i Assemblies. To all these, the followers of the Baha'i faith of Baha'u'llah have with feelings of burning agony and heroic fortitude, unanimously and unreservedly submitted, ever mindful of the guiding principles of Baha'i conduct, that in connection with their administrative activities, no matter how grievously interference with them might affect the course of the extension of the movement, and the suspension of which does not constitute in itself a departure from the principle of loyalty to their faith, the considered judgment and authoritative decrees issued by their responsible rulers must, if they be faithful to Baha'u'llah's and Abdul Baha's express injunctions, be thoroughly respected and loyally obeyed. The case we are looking at here in the writings of Shoghi Effendi is only one case of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of incidents that happened within the Soviet sphere, as well as with other communist states throughout the world. In this case, Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, is saying that the Soviet state has the free exercise of its legitimate rights. That the Baha'is, as befits their position as loyal and law-abiding citizens, they must comply. And what was this? This was the taking of the only house of worship that the Baha'is had at the time and taking it for the interests of the states, as it was doing with almost all religious monuments and buildings. In addition to that, and I'm going to focus on this for a second, the suspension of all meetings, commemoration, gatherings, festivals, suppressing committees, national spiritual assemblies, prohibiting the raising of funds, the transmission of financial contributions, the full and frequent inspect inspection of any deliberations, decisions, plans, and actions of Baha'i assemblies, dissolving of young men's clubs, children's organizations, strict censorship on all correspondence, minute investigation of papers, documents, suspending of all periodicals, bulletins, magazines, and the deportation of leading personalities in the cause. And, as the Guardian here says, that the Baha'is, in their heroic fortitude, unanimously and unreservedly submitted to the proclamations of the state. This issue in particular raises up a question. Why is it that we as a society seem to have a sort of collective amnesia about actually how religious communities have been treated under state atheism and express programs of secularization of states. This, however, before I begin, is not to impute error or falsity to the beliefs of an atheist or an agnostic or a, or a secularist. It is to call attention to humanity <laughs> to the grievous wrongs that have actually been perpetrated under the name of atheism and secularism. Thousands upon thousands of thousands of churches and cathedrals, seminaries and convents were completely shut down by state atheistic societies, particularly because they were religious and were seen as negative, outmoded, ignorant and wrong. This happened throughout all of the Eastern Bloc, Eastern Europe, all the way throughout the Soviet states. In fact, some of the largest cathedrals ever built within the Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox world were completely destroyed. And I mean dynamited. Where entire seminaries and cathedrals would just be taken over and used as storehouses. Where actually bells were torn out of bell towers and melted down. It is very peculiar, myself being a student of history, that the vast majority of people don't know that most of these things happened. We seem to have just wanted to cover that period of human history. Or for example, in a state of like Albania, thousands of churches and mosques were just destroyed or completely taken over by the state. And in many of these cultures, you had explicit anti-religious propaganda taught directly in schools. 
Why am I bringing this up? Does this mean, as I said, secularism, atheism, or agnosticism is actually false? No. It is actually that there is an unthinking, unquestioning imitation of certain proclamations by people about the ignorance or evils of religion that have actually resulted in horrible, horrible atrocities on a scale that really actually almost numbs the heart when one begins to look into it. Why is it important to look at these things? Because there is no option currently on the table on the grand social scene. The Baha'is are offering an option to get out of this divisiveness and hatred and prejudice through the teachings of Baha'u'llah. The option of secularism and atheism is not an option if you're looking for a society or culture or movement that itself has no blood on its hands. Before moving on from this point, it is important to be clear about what I am talking about. Very often when I've had this discussion, people will say, well, just because they were atheist doesn't mean what they did was because they were atheist. Or they'll point to, say, certain aspects of communist ideology that are really just completely off the wall. The reason why that doesn't really work is because this was specifically done because these were religious people and religious institutions that were seen as enemies of the state. We do not wish to just simply count all the wrongs done. And I want to be very, very clear, this does not impute falsity to atheism. And this also brings up the issue of the eradication of the, the religious question. I've had people say to me, you know, honestly, if religion wasn't forced upon people, you know, in a generation or so, it would be completely gone. Well, we've tried that. In fact, we've actually tried forced secularization on hundreds of millions of people. We actually attempted, with military force and destruction of cultural relics on a shockingly widespread scale, to efface the very existence of religion. And I really, really charge anyone listening or having a concern about the truth claims that I'm making to genuinely look into the destruction of cathedrals, churches, mosques, and the complete and utter, complete and utter prohibition against religious groups, young men's clubs, women's clubs, etc. within many of the state atheistic societies that we've seen. Please look into this. What won't work? Ignoring the topic of religion is not going to help. It allows it to just fester in the background, and it creates a culture where we won't even talk about an issue. Where I think it would be much more important just to bring it out in the open, acknowledge that we disagree, and actually try to see if we actually can find bridges between our beliefs. It won't work to actually create straw men. To pretend that a religious system believes such and such, and that it's not actually an honest and genuine representation of the belief of another person. Ridicule and mocking people of another belief, which seems to be on the rise, is not going to help. It entrenches people. It drives them deeper and deeper into the belief system because they're being attacked. Trying to eradicate religion by force certainly is not going to help. We've tried that as a global culture throughout state atheism. We've attempted to remove religious monuments, to actually forbid religious associations, even place ceremonies of a non-religious nature over top of religious ceremonies, so that they, the eradication of these faiths can actually be enacted. It does not work, and the revival of religion after these societies collapse has been very, very quick. So what can we do? What we have to do here is to really investigate the heart of the problem. And I want to propose something that I call the equation. A person could state religion is the cause of war, hatred, and division, and come to a series of radically different conclusions or lines of action given that piece of data. For example, I could say religion is the cause of war, hatred, and division, therefore religion is false. It is not true. 
I can say religion is the cause of war, hatred, and division, and therefore we actually have to do everything we can to eradicate religion, if necessary by force, from the human body politic. And that has been a conclusion of large groups of people. I could say religion is the cause of war, hatred, and division, therefore we should get people of different religions together on panels to talk to each other so that they can see that the individual across the table is not so alien, not so foreign, and to see them as a person. I myself have been involved in interfaith uh, panels, and this is one conclusion from the war, hatred, and division. I could say that religion is the cause of war, hatred, and division, therefore we should teach religious unity. We should abandon religion, or even I don't want to talk about it. So, what is it that we decide on the end of this? Religion causes war, hatred, and division. Therefore, what? And what concerns me often in this case is that when we put something in on this side of the equation, which is instead of religion, we put another topic, another word, another concept, often we don't have the same conclusion. So, for example, if I say, um, religion causes war, hatred, and division, therefore it's false. Well, what if I put in scarcity of resources, or desire for resources? It causes war, hatred, and division, because it does. Therefore, resources are false, or should be abandoned, or fought against. I don't think we'd ever come to that conclusion. Politics, for example, has been the cause of war, hatred, and division. Therefore, politics is bad, dangerous, is false, or should be abandoned. We generally don't hear that either. What's going on? Um, racial differences has been the cause of war, hatred, and division. Therefore, we should get rid of all racial differences. We don't come to this conclusion either. Money has caused war, hatred, and division. Desire for land, therefore we should get rid of money and the desire for land. So when we put these different things within the equation, we don't seem to come up with the same result. Uh, people do not say, you know, there's been a lot of d division and hatred along uh, racist lines. Therefore, I just I don't I don't want to talk about different uh, ethnicities and races. Or we have to get together somehow to like force people to breed so that they stop having racial differences. We do not look at something like the desire for land, like Liebensraum. <laughs> And this desire for living space and say well, you know, this was this was integral into the in the cause of actual warfare or Therefore what we should really do is actually get rid of it Or it's wrong to desire uh, living space Do I really come up or come away with the same conclusions and invariably I find we don't Money and desire for money has caused a lot of pain but it's not inherently bad. It depends on how it's being used. Power itself is not inherently bad. It can actually be wonderful. So, it's really about how we use power, how we approach power with our hearts and our minds. When it comes to racial diversity, racial diversity itself is not bad. Racism is. Political ideologies. We need political systems in order to govern our world. Yes, they can, in the end, be an agency for the causing of division and hatred, and even warfare. But does that mean that politics is false, or should be gotten rid of, or abandoned, or shouldn't be talked about? No, quite the opposite. We need to explore it. The breeding ground of all these tragedies is prejudice. Prejudice of race and nation, of religion, of political opinion, and the root cause of prejudice is blind imitation of the past, imitation in religion, in racial attitudes, in national bias, in politics. So long as this aping of the past persisteth, just so long will the foundations of the social order be blown to the four winds. Just so long will humanity be continually exposed to direst peril. What is the breeding ground for all these tragedies? Prejudice. Prejudice of race, nation, religion, and political opinion. It is not races, nations, religions, or politics, but rather prejudice. And what is that Baha actually stating is itself the root cause of that prejudice. It is blind imitation of the past. 
a refusal to use our hearts and our minds to investigate these issues afresh and anew, separated from our biases, separated from our blind adherence to our own faiths, political ideologies, our own nations, or our own even racial background. And as long as this, quoting, aping of the past persisteth, just so long will the foundations of the social order be blown to the four winds and be in the direst peril. It is actually ignorance itself and an unwillingness to investigate these things, an unwillingness to discuss them and explore them, that is causing the very prejudice itself, that is causing the division, the hatred, and the war. For centuries and cycles, humanity has been engaged in war and conflict. At one time, the pretext for war has been religion. At another time, patriotism, racial prejudice, national politics, territorial conquest or commercial expansion. In brief, humanity has never been at peace during the period of known history. What blood has been shed? How many fathers have mourned the loss of sons? How many sons have wept for fathers and mothers for dear ones? Human beings have been the food and targets of the battlefield, and everywhere warfare and strife have been the theme and burden of history. Ferocity has characterized men even more than animals. The lion, tiger, bear, and wolf are ferocious because of their needs. Here in this passage again, one time the pretext for war has been religion, patriotism, racial prejudice, national politics, territorial conquest or commercial expansion. We have actually seen colonial empires spread just for money. The subjugation of whole ethnic groups and whole nations. Why? Largely for commercial expansion. Do we believe commerce, commerce, therefore, is inherently bad? That we shouldn't have commerce? No. What we have to do is use our hearts and minds to actually explore these things and see what the very foundation and purpose of commerce is. And then seek that. Up to the present time in history, the world of humanity has neither attained nor enjoyed any measure of peace, owing to incessant conditions of hostility and strife. History is a continuous and consecutive record of warfare brought about by religious, sectarian, racial, patriotic, and political causes. The world of humanity has found no rest. Mankind has always been in conflict engaged in destroying the foundations, pillaging the properties, and possessing the lands and territory of each other, especially in the earlier periods of savagery and barbarism, where the whole races and people were carried away captive by their conquerors. Who shall measure or estimate the tremendous destruction of human life resulting from this hostility and strife? A continuous and consecutive record of warfare brought about by what? Religious, sectarian, racial, patriotic, and political causes. This is why we found no rest. That whole ethnicities and whole cultures would actually just be taken and exiled away. Why? Because they don't speak the same language. They have a different culture. Does this mean we need to eradicate all of these things? No. We actually have to investigate them, talk about them, and explore them. Through the teachings of Baha'u'llah, the horizon of the East was made radiant and glorious. Souls who have hearkened to his words and accepted his message live together today in complete fellowship and love. They even offer their lives for each other. They forgo and renounce worldly possessions for one another, each preferring the other to himself. This has been due to the declaration and foundation of the oneness of the world of humanity. Today in Persia there are meetings and assemblages wherein souls who have become illumined by the teachings of Baha'u'llah, representative Muslims, Christians, Jews, Zoroastrianists, Buddhists, and of the various denominations of each, mingle and conjoin in perfect fellowship and absolute agreement. A wonderful brotherhood and love is established among them, and all are united in spirit and service for international peace. More than 20,000 Baha'is have given their lives in martyrdom for the cause of God. The governments of the East arose against them, bent upon their extermination. 
They were killed relentlessly, but day by day their numbers have increased. Day by day they have multiplied in strength and become more eloquent. They have now been strengthened through the efficacy of a wonderful spiritual power. How savage and fearful the ferocity of men against his fellow man. Consider what is taking place now in the Balkans, what blood is being shed. Even the wild beasts and ferocious animals do not commit such acts. The most ferocious wolf kills but one sheep a day, and even that for his food. But now in the Balkans, one man destroys ten fellow beings. The commanders of armies glory in having killed ten thousand men, not for food, nay, rather for military control, territorial greed, fame, and possession of the dust of the earth. They kill for national aggrandizement, notwithstanding this terrestrial globe is but a dark world of grossest matter. It is a world of sorrow and grief, a world of disappointment and unhappiness, a world of death. For after all, the earth is but the everlasting graveyard, the vast, universal cemetery of all mankind. Yet men fight to possess this graveyard, waging war and battle, killing each other. What ignorance! How spacious the earth is with room and plenty for all! How thoughtful the providence which has so allotted that every man may derive his sustenance from it! The Lord, our Creator, does not order that anyone should starve or live in want. All are intended to participate in the blessed and abundant bestowals of our God. Fundamentally, all warfare and bloodshed in the human world are due to the lack of unity between the religions, which through superstitions and adherence to theological dogmas have obscured the one reality which is the source and basis of them all. In this quote from Abdu'l-Baha, what is he saying? He is asking the individuals to look to the Baha'i community and explore what they're trying to do and what actually has been the result since its founding. That you have, again, Muslims, Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians, Buddhists of various denominations mingle and conjoin in fellowship and agreement. That we're actually seeing a global order small though it be, seed-like though it be, of people putting aside their prejudices and their biases, but not their faiths. They're actually saying, yes, I'm a Buddhist, but I can now recognize that the same light that I actually see within the Buddha's teachings, I see that same light within the teachings of the Ba, or the teachings of Baha'u'llah. They're coming together in agreement. I myself know former Christian scholars. I myself know former Muslims, former atheists, former secularists. People who are coming together and trying to do their best to really understand religion and actually how it is interplayed upon the historical scene. What its true purpose was for. And studying that together. I want to call attention to the very last line of the quote that we just heard from Abdu'l-Baha. Fundamentally, all warfare and bloodshed in the human world are due to a lack of unity between religions which, through superstitions and adherence to theological dogmas, have obscured the one reality which is the source and basis of them all. What we have to look at is that the prejudices that have arisen have arisen because of a blind adherence and imitation of what other individuals have said. The time has come when humankind needs to stand up as individuals, in therefore rising up a collective where we're willing to truly look at these revelations of God afresh, because we can actually see them all as different scenes on the same spiritual tapestry. Different colors of the same light, or the same light in different lamps. That this is actually what Baha'u'llah has come to ask humankind to do. For now, we'll move on, though. Money, power, politics, resources, land, the human mind. All these things can be beautiful. And actually can be servants of the progress and uplifting and enlightenment of humankind. 
The technologies that have been given to us by science themselves can bring humankind together. They can lift us up and educate us. They can give us access to so many things. And yet at the same time, they can be engines of destruction and division. Any agency whatever, though it be the instrument of mankind's greatest good, is capable of misuse. Its proper use or abuse depends on the varying degrees of enlightenment, capacity, faith, honesty, devotion, and high-mindedness of the leaders of public opinion. Yes, politics can actually rise up humankind and bring us together in beautiful cultures. But they can also be used to fashion fanatical groups who will seek to destroy the very lives of other human beings, even human beings within their own state. Technology itself can be a wonderful thing where we can reach out across the planet and actually interact with people we've never ever met before and learn about cultures that we have never ever heard of before. But that very same technology can be used to manipulate human minds, to steal their freedoms, to actually destroy human lives. Cases like where we actually saw within the Rwandan genocide, where actually the radios were used as engines to direct the very genocide that was carried out in that state. Where technology itself was used within the Soviet bloc and within most of the communist blocs to actually subjugate people, to control them in the forms of secret police, of censorship, etc. Even now, we can actually use technology to forward the cause of the equality of women. But we can also use that same technology for the widespread distribution of pornography, even for the subjugation of children into the sex trade. These things are like nuclear energy. We can power an entire culture or blow it up. It depends upon what? The varying degrees of enlightenment, capacity, faith, honesty, devotion, and high-mindedness of the leaders of public opinion. This is actually what it relies upon. And this is important when we actually begin to look at the issue of religion and division and war. Especially when we look in the past. Because in the past, what really were, if you will, the pillars of power? If in the Middle Ages, for example, you wished to be able to wield power culturally, for good or bad, in fact, where could you go? You could be part of the royalty, part of the aristocracy, right? Or you could actually put yourself into holy orders. Infiltrate, if you will, the corridors of power through religion. And given that it wielded so much power, like nuclear energy, it could then be used improperly, unjustly, even evilly. So to see, at least for myself, to see within the annals of history, abuses of power within the corridors of power is really genuinely not all that surprising. Where else would you go if you were not an aristocrat already of blue blood, if you will? It does not forgive them or excuse individuals that have done this, but it is for myself not remotely surprising to see people seeing an energy, seeing a tool, having in their heart not faith, honesty, devotion, and high-mindedness, but having self-interest, not believing, for example, in justice or honesty or compassion as true virtues of humankind, and then utilizing those instruments of power to their own dark ends. It is true that there are foolish individuals who have never properly examined the fundamentals of the divine religions, who have taken as their criterion to the behavior of a few religious hypocrites and measured all religious persons by that yardstick, and have on this account concluded that religions are an obstacle to progress, a divisive factor in a cause of malevolence and enmity among people. 
they have not even observed this much, that the principles of the divine religions can hardly be evaluated by the acts of those who only claim to follow them. For every excellent thing, peerless though it may be, can still be diverted to the wrong ends. A lighted lamp in the hands of an ignorant child or of the blind will not dispel the surrounding darkness nor light up the house. It will set both the bearer and the house on fire. Can we, in such an instance, blame the lamp? No, by the Lord God. To the seen, a lamp is a guide and will show him his path, but it is it is a disaster to the blind. He is stating that people should not be taking the actions of some of the adherents of religion as a yardstick whereby to measure religion. This was self-evident to me when I was actually in my late teens. And I myself was, I can honestly say, genuinely anti-religious. Why? Because I had actually grown up in the Catholic Church. And I knew generally, and it seemed a lot more than my peers at the time, what it actually taught. So what, oftentimes when I saw individuals of religious background doing certain things, I knew definitively that that was in opposition to the actual teachings. Even when we actually call religious people hypocrites, we are calling them hypocrites because the teachings themselves are high and they are acting low. This was very obvious to me. Here he gives this example as well, that every excellent thing, peerless though it may be, can still be diverted to the wrong ends. And he gives the example of a lighted, hands, a lighted lamp in the hands of an ignorant child. You give something of great power and capacity into the hands of someone who does not know how to wield it, and does not have the maturity nor the intellect to actually deal with it, and what does it do? It starts a fire. But the lamp itself cannot be blamed. It is an agency for pushing back darkness. This is the free will of humankind. Of course individuals have abused power in the corridors of power of religion. Now when it comes to the equation, which we looked at formerly in this topic itself, many people will say, well, at least you know, we can't get rid of money, we can't get rid of politics, we can't get rid of land <laughs> resources or racial diversity, but maybe this is actually one we can get rid of. The one question I would ask is, how? How? Is it by not talking about it? Because that doesn't work. Is it about actually suppressing the free speech of religious individuals? Because that doesn't work, and I don't think that's correct. I don't think that's morally right. Is it about the destruction of religious artifacts or monuments or the forbidding of, of studying religious texts? That also has been tried, and I think most people would actually agree that that's just really, really unjust and dark. So why, how is it we're supposed to get rid of it? And given it always comes back, even after radical attempts at its extermination, how are we to actually carry that out? If anything, you're going to say that it actually has to be carried out through dialogue and discourse. I would ask that it not be ridicule, as again, as it seems to be a common trend. Um, to not mock people's perspectives, but to have an honest discussion about it. But in that honest discussion, we're not gonna we're gonna have to actually look at it and not use straw men arguments, not present these belief systems in their lowest form, but actually seek out their most intelligent forms and actually really address those. But that just means we're in the process of dialogue. And then we actually have to be able to try and look at how we can have cordial, loving and respectful dialogue upon these lines. But this is actually what the Baha'is are asking. To investigate once again the foundations of these faiths and the foundations of these belief systems in their scriptural and historical context. And from a Baha'i perspective, under the rubric of progressive revelation, which places them in their historical evolutionary context. So now, yes, I can, for example, stop everyone from being electrocuted by eradicating electricity. But I don't think that's really the solution. I know that there's another issue that often comes up is that 
for myself and my own experiences, where people will say, well, then why is it that religion is allowed to be this way? If it is actually a revelation from God, why does God allow it to be used in such an unjust way? Why does he allow it to be like nuclear, nuclear energy? And it's, it's really interesting because this seems to be a question, but why God doesn't make religion some kind of magic pill? That if someone accepts religion, they automatically cannot do bad things with it. And this is really peculiar, because this would mean that the automatically, when someone actually, say, took the pill of religion, it would be incapable of using it for something wrong. It would be a magic pill. But this is the, the very essence of robbing us of our autonomy, of our freedom, of our ability to actually choose our own paths. It also robs us of our ability to hide our true intentions, which is itself foundational to the principles of free will. Humankind has to be able to actually do things wrong, to actually crash dad's car, to make errors in order for us to evolve morally. But this is the same thing as intellectually. God could have undeniably just given us all of physics, given us the perfect theory of biology, explained all of history and geology to us. But God doesn't. God has placed us within a world where we actually have to fight to explore such things. We have to exercise discipline and honesty and a love of truth in order to uncover these things, to pull them from behind the veil of ignorance. And it's only through doing such things this way that we truly and genuinely come to the point where we can actually value something and see it as beautiful. Education is beautiful because it isn't given to us on a platter. True religion is actually beautiful because it has to be fought for. One actually has to try to be disciplined. One actually has to try to actually study and explore and then submit to moral and intellectual truths that they uncover. So no, this can't be stopped. We cannot have it that religion is a magic pill, unless we're going to give up the very evolutionary capacity that is given to us by the world in which we live. So what is the root problem? The root problem is prejudice. All the existing nations had a divine foundation of truth or reality originally, which was intended to be conducive to the unity and accord of mankind. But the light of that reality gradually became obscured. The darkness of superstitions and imitations came and took its place, binding the world of humanity in the chains and fetters of ignorance. Enmity arose among men, increasing to such an extent that nations strove against nation in hatred and violence. War has been a religious and political human heritage. There are many passages like this in the Baha'i writings. And I really want to highlight this. All the existing nations had a divine foundation of truth or reality originally. Now there is in essence a seed of truth and beauty in the foundations of almost every belief system in the world. But they become obscured, truly, truly obscured, through imitation and dogma, and even just the sands of time. Baha'u'llah said that God had sent religion for the purpose of establishing fellowship among humankind, and not to create strife and discord. For all religion is founded upon the love of humanity. Abraham promulgated this principle. Moses summoned all to its recognition. Christ established it, and Muhammad directed mankind to its standard. This is the reality of religion. If we abandon hearsay and investigate the reality and inner significance of the heavenly teachings, we will find the same divine foundation of love for humanity. The purport is that religion is intended to be the cause of unity, love, and fellowship, and not discord, enmity, and estrangement. Man has forsaken the foundation of divine religion and adhered to blind imitations. Each nation has clung to its own imitations, 
And because these are at variance, warfare, bloodsheds, and destruction of the foundation of humanity have resulted. True religion is based upon love and agreement. If enmity and hatred exist, irreligion is preferable. Therefore, the removal of this dissension has been specialized in Baha'u'llah. The root problem here is prejudice. That prejudice deriving from ignorance and imitation. An unwillingness to truly investigate religion. If we abandon hearsay, Abdu'l-Bah says, and investigate the reality and inner significance of the heavenly teachings, we will find the same divine foundation of love for humanity. What is being asked here? Forget what our pastors said. Forget what our priests or our mullahs or our monks have said. Forget what I've said. Go out and actually truly genuinely investigate these traditions. And investigate ones you don't agree with and don't believe in. And I would suggest even when we begin, this is my own opinion again, and when we begin to actually study ancient faiths, which we call mythology, we begin to see, if you will, the gems of truth shining out from inside them. We can actually pick up gems and dust them off and explore them, and see that this foundation that really was true in its origin has become obscured. Therefore, it is evident that ignorance and misunderstanding have caused so much warfare and strife between Christians and Muslims. If both should investigate the underlying truths of their religious beliefs, the outcome would be unity and agreement, strife and bitterness would pass away forever, and the world of humanity find peace and composure. Consider that there are 250 million Christians and 300 million Muslims. How much blood has flowed in their wars? How many nations have been destroyed? How many children have been made fatherless? How many fathers and mothers have mourned the loss of children and dear ones? All this has been due to prejudice, misunderstanding, and imitations of ancestral beliefs without investigation of reality. If the holy books were rightly understood, none of this discord and distress would have existed, but love and fellowship would have prevailed instead. This is true with all the other religions as well. The conditions I have named will apply equally to all. The essential purpose of the religion of God is to establish unity among mankind. The divine manifestations were founders of the means of fellowship and love. They did not come to create discord, strife, and hatred in the world. The religion of God is the cause of love, but if it is made to be the source of enmity and bloodshed, surely its absence is preferable to its existence, for then it becomes satanic, detrimental, and an obstacle to the human world. An acknowledgement of the division that has happened. An expression that the absence of religion is preferable to hatred, division, enshrined within the very writings of the Baha'i faith. That an irreligious man is preferable to a religious man if that individual in being religious is actually productive of hatred and division and warfare and strife. That once again, if we should investigate the underlying truth, the outcome would be unity and agreement. That call of Baha'u'llah and the Bab, uttered from the beginning of their dispensations, from the beginning of their revelations, that humankind come together to investigate and recognize the common spiritual heritage that they all hold. But not doing this on blind faith, not simply believing it for the sake of believing it, or believing it because it sounds good, or even believing it simply because it might actually quell some of their religious hatred, but because it's true. Because it's true and found to be true through investigation, not imitation, and the aping of what others believe. To once again pick up these traditions and truly and genuinely investigate them. The enmity and strife of nations, therefore, are due to religious imitations and not to the reality which underlies the teachings of the prophets. Through Baha'u'llah, the nations and the peoples grew to understand and comprehend this. Therefore, hearts became united and lives were cemented together. After centuries of hatred and bitterness, the Christian, Jew, Zoroastrian, 
Muslim, and Buddhist met in fellowship, all of them in the utmost love and unity. They became welded and cemented because they had perceived reality. Now, therefore, if the Christian and Jewish people investigate the reality underlying their prophet's teachings, they will become kind in their attitude toward each other and associate in the utmost love, for reality is one and not dual or multiple. If this investigation of reality becomes universal, the divergent nations will ratify all the divine prophets and confirm all the holy books. No strife or rancor will then remain, and the world will become united. Then will we associate in the reality of love. We will become as fathers and sons, as brothers and sisters, living together in complete unity, love and happiness. For this century is a century of light. It is not like former centuries. Former centuries were epochs of oppression. Now human intellects have developed, and human intelligence has increased. Each soul is investigating reality. This is not a time when we shall wage war and be hostile toward each other. We are living at a time when we should enjoy real friendship. Abdul Baha is telling us that we have come to a point in history where humankind has become mature enough to do this. Then, in essence, these past strifes, warfares, and ages are because of the immaturity of humankind, but that now man has been endued with a new capacity, a new capability for humanity to rise up and begin to investigate independently through the process of universal education to see what that these divergent nations will ratify the divine prophets and confirm all the holy books. That through this investigation, the Christian can actually recognize the call of God in the Quran, as peculiar as that seems to so many. That the Hindu can actually look at the writings of the Buddha and see the real truth and beauty of Brahman reflected therein. And that we can actually confirm it and see this grand history, this amazingly beautiful tapestry portraying the grand spiritual drama of humankind and see all as one. This is actually what Baha'u'llah has been asking us to do. This is what the Bab asked us to do. And what we've been asking, being asked to do for coming up on 200 years. To come together. Not misrepresent each other's beliefs. Investigate wholeheartedly and do not say that this is, well, this is what Christians believe when it really actually means some of the dogmas of one's own church. Or that Buddhists believe this. Let's just look at the, the Buddha's writings and not have to come out of them with a belief in what the, this, sorry, not have to come out of them with a belief that is exactly identical to a specific Buddhist school. Come on, that's never going to happen. <laughs> the one thing I would like to say, if this seems so difficult to believe for individuals, please first of all see uh, one of our videos on uh, utopian, utopianism. But I will acknowledge here that for someone to say like, come on man, that, like, that's never going to happen. Um, this is not an argument. It's generally just a brush off. It definitely won't happen if individuals won't attempt to do it. Because this is actually carried on the back of human beings. But I don't think actually this is actually this is as radically bizarre or unlikely as people think. When we look at history, I think we really have to recall that Buddhism, which blanketed massive sections of the planet, just started by one individual, the Buddha, in a forest, a wandering ascetic. That Christianity, which boasts almost two billion adherents, and took over the Roman Empire, a radically diverse culture with unbelievably diverse spiritual and religious beliefs, actually came from a, on the historical surface, what seems like a crucified, failed, itinerant teacher in the backwoods of the Roman Empire. The Prophet Muhammad, whose teachings blanketed all of North Africa, all of the Middle East, and all the way into India, K-1 
came from a cultural backwater, an individual who was really just a merchant in the eyes of history, and who for a moment, in most cases, people would have said would have never spread. This is actually the truth of all religious dispensations. The blanketing of massive swaths of humankind in a unifying belief, where when you looked at it at its outset, it would have looked like almost nothing and doomed to failure. This is seeing the tree in the small seed, seeing the great oak in the small seed. But there's an interesting part to this on top of that. If the listener here was thinking that they actually believe that actually secularism is the answer, or atheism is the answer to the solution to this problem, they invariably believe the exact same thing I'm proposing, that individuals have to investigate these traditions, really, really look at them, wake up, become enlightened, see the truth, and cast off the shackles of religion. Therefore, we all believe, in that case, in a highly, highly unlikely thing, which means now we simply have to investigate which program, which conceptual program, will best serve us. There is another facet of the Baha'i perspective that I would like to share, is that there is in many ways an evolutionary pressure bearing down on humankind. There are integrative forces within society and disintegrative forces at work and at play within human culture. That actually the fanaticisms, the anger and the rage is driving people to investigate many of these belief systems. And at the same time, there are people working fully on the integrative side, trying to bring together multi-faith groups, have people meet up and break bread and sit down and talk and see the other as one of their own. I would like here to read a quote from Baha'u'llah. That the diverse communions of the earth and the manifold systems of religious belief should never be allowed to foster the feelings of animosity among men is in this day of the essence of the faith of God and his religion. These principles and laws, these firmly established and mighty systems, have proceeded from one source and are rays of one light. That they differ one from another is to be attributed to the varying requirements of the ages in which they were promulgated. Gird up the loins of your endeavor, O people of Baha, that haply the tumult of religious dissension and strife that agitateth the peoples of the earth may be stilled, that every trace of it may be completely obliterated. For the love of God and them that serve him Arise to aid this sublime and momentous revelation. Religious fanaticism and hatred are a world-devouring fire, whose violence none can quench. The hand of divine power can alone deliver mankind from this desolating affliction. Consider the war that hath involved the two nations, how both sides have renounced their possessions and their lives how many the villages that were completely wiped out. The utterance of God is a lamp, whose light is these words, Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. Deal ye one with another with the utmost love and harmony, with friendliness and fellowship. He who is the day star of truth beareth me witness. So powerful is the light of unity that it can illuminate the whole earth. The one true God, he who knoweth all things, himself testifieth to the truth of these words. The first section of this quote declares in the words of Baha'u'llah that the different religious beliefs should never be allowed to create animosity. And that this is the essence of the faith of God in his religion. This is the fundamental essence of Baha'u'llah's revelation, is to bring together humankind. And that these principles, these, these again, firmly established and mighty systems of faith, have proceeded from one source. Why do they seem so different? 
that is to be attributed to the varying requirements of the age in which they were promulgated. Both are intellectual teachings, their spiritual teachings as well as their social teachings, were actually a remedy given to a patient. Please see the talk here on, the, on our channel on the unity of religion. What does Baha'u'llah then say? That we actually have to gird up our loins. We actually have to arise that dis religious dissension and strife can be ended. The religious differences and divisions which exist in the world are due to blind imitations of forms without knowledge or investigation of the fundamental divine reality which underlies all the religions. Inasmuch as these imitations of ancestral forms are various, dissensions have arisen among the people of religion. Therefore, it is necessary to free mankind from this subjection to blind belief by pointing the way of guidance to reality itself, which is the only basis of unity. Therefore, when man through sincere investigation discovers the fundamental reality of religion, his former prejudices disappear and his new condition of enlightenment is conducive to the development of the world of humanity. This is the constant resounding theme of the Baha'i Writings. That so powerful is the light of unity that it can illumine the whole earth. And that that light of unity can be achieved through the removing of blind imitation, of aping of the past. That we actually have to point the way of guidance to reality itself. And that, once again, when sincere investigation discovers the reality of religions, that prejudices disappear a condition of enlightenment is conducive to the development of the world of humanity. To invite people to really, genuinely, honestly investigate. And to see in front of us that if there is any light and beauty and wonder in our own faith, that we have to do our best to actually represent that in our, the temple of ourselves, through our deeds as we approach someone. Even if you come from a tradition where you believe this other person is completely and utterly and radically wrong and in the clutches of evil. If you're going to approach such an individual, you have to be willing to listen, to hear, to talk, to save them. In the Baha'i perspective, it is to see the gem and beauty in these dispensations these various belief systems, even this concern that we're actually investigating, to see the virtuous intention of someone who wants to step, step outside of the fray of dissension and hatred, even if it's an erroneous move, even if it's not the best maneuver, we actually have to see that gem of beauty inside of it. There's an interesting facet of this, what I will say, a call to arms to people to actually begin to investigate and talk about these things. That is a direct response to the empathy and concern that people are expressing who express this concern about religion. It is this, that the body count, forgive that phrase, but the body count of apathy is enormous. I think we all know that across our globe in this day, Humankind is suffering horribly. Whether it be in the case of a lack of access to medicine, whether it be child soldiery, child prostitution, prostitution, drug addiction, living in war zones. That the death toll and the amount of suffering that is actually currently going on in our world because of an unwillingness to stand up and do something is far more numerically, I would suggest, than any crusades. It is apathy that we should be most afraid of, most willing to actually countenance. That really, in the end, what we need is people who are, even if wrong, passionate about doing what is right rising up and doing their best to begin to have a discussion. A discussion based on rationality, 
on investigation, on research, on devotion and high-mindedness. To reach out to see the see someone else not as an other, as an alien, but as a brother or sister that we can actually have dialogue with. In the end, this is a call for help. I think in the end, that's really the general appeal I want to make to my friends. It's help us even if you disagree. Sounds strange, but help us disagree well. I often say to my brothers and sisters within the Baha'i community, we actually have to learn within our own community to disagree better. Not to avoid topics, but to have honest and genuine discussions in loving and compassionate ways. To maintain peace. And in doing so, be able to reach out to someone else, have a radically different worldview, empathize with their perspectives, and do our best to actually answer it. I want to offer two last quotes from Abdu'l-Bahá. The foundations of all the divine religions are peace and agreement, but misunderstandings and ignorance have developed. If these are caused to disappear, you will see that all the religious agencies will work for peace and promulgate the oneness of humankind. For the foundation of all is reality, and reality is not multiple or divisible. Moses founded it. Jesus raised its tent, and its brilliant light has shone forth in all the religions. Baha'u'llah proclaimed this one reality and spread the message of the most great peace. All who have accepted his teachings are lovers of peace, peacemakers ready to sacrifice their lives and expend their possessions for it. Let us strive with all our powers to unite the East and West, so that the nations of the world may be advanced, and that all may live according to the one foundation of the religions of God. The essentials of the divine religion are one reality, indivisible and not multiple. It is one. And when through investigation we find it to be single, we have a basis for the oneness of the world of humanity. Peace and agreement have been the foundation of all the world's religions. Ignorance has caused prejudice to disappear. That if we actually are able to rise up and use our hearts and minds, these great gifts of God to humankind, we can actually begin an investigation and we will see that these religious agencies will work for peace. That yes, this nuclear energy can actually be used to blow things up, but it can actually be used to power things. That yes, the internet can be used for misinformation, for the wasting of human time, and even for very evil things, but it can also be used for universal education. That any agency whatsoever, though it be for the greatest betterment of humankind, can be misused. But we have to understand what its use is and seek to show that and actually rise it up, polish it off, if you will, and show its true pristine beauty. All who have accepted his teachings are lovers of peace, peacemakers, ready to sacrifice their lives and expend their possessions for it. We actually have to be willing to rise up, study these different faiths, listen to people's different belief systems, reach out our hand in the hopes of actually creating a more unified world. Strive with all our powers to unite the East and the West. The essentials of the divine religion are one reality, not multiple. It is one. And here's the final quote. And when through investigation we find it to be single, we have a basis for the oneness of the world of humanity. Through investigation, through the use of our intellect, when we can finally come to a place where we're willing to use our minds, put aside our prejudices and our biases, and truly investigate these dispensations, we can actually show rationally that they are one. And when, when that happens, when this happened for me, it was suddenly seeing, and I've mentioned this several times, this grand tapestry which showed the history of humankind. All these different scenes in this great spiritual drama of humanity that shows we really truly are one. That the light that is in the Buddha is the same light in Jesus Christ. And the light that is shining through the Prophet Muhammad from the Arabian Peninsula is 
that light which was shining in Krishna. All we have to be willing to do is talk and explore. Thank you very much.